Hey guys, welcome to the Groves Church Online. My name is Pastor Bob Bickford, and uh, we want to welcome you. We thank you for stopping by and looking in. And so you are going to see our online service, which is different from our in-person service. Every week we gather in person at 10 a.m., and we learn about God, we sing songs, and we help people take their next steps with God. So we would love for you to join us. We realize for some of you, this might be the first step towards that. And so thanks for checking it out. The message will uh, come after a couple of songs. The whole online service will be about 30 minutes and we'll give you an opportunity to respond. So we invite you to stay tuned till the very end. And then we would like to hear from you. On the screen, you'll see a QR code and an email and a contact information piece. So you can scan that code and you can fill out that contact form or you can email us or call us and let us know that you have a question or just let us know that we might be able to help you in some way. That's what we're here for. We're in the community for the community. We want to help people take their next steps with God. So we are glad that you stopped by. We hope that this is encouraging to you and we would love to hear from you. So thank you for joining and watching this morning. Saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in this excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus has fled. Well, one of the things that all of uh, us are dealing with in the culture that we live in is chaos, right? This whole series, Steadfast, has been dealing with how do we live lives that honor God? How do we relate to one another in helpful ways? And then as Christians, how do we demonstrate the goodness of God and glorify Him in how we live in the culture that we find ourselves existing in, living in, operating in, working in, all of those sorts of things. And if you are like most, one of the things you know is that over the last several months, in fact, really over the last year plus, we have been finding ourselves in a very transition, very transitional type of culture. And we're all trying to, to get our bearings and find our footing. And it's affecting everyone. And so much so that what we're seeing is it's affecting relationships, it's affecting economics, it's affecting mental health. I looked up some stats on mental health in the last several months, and here's what I found. The depression rates have increased in 2021, and adult in adults, depression nearly tripled in 2020 due to the pandemic and all the things that were associated with it. Before COVID-19 hit, depression levels were at 8.5%, and they rose to 27.8% 
in 2020. Now, it really didn't stop there because in the most recent set of months, and we're really, frankly, we're at the end of 2021, depression rates right now stand at, according to surveys, 32.8%. So here's the deal. One in every three persons that you meet is dealing with depression in some sort of fashion. That's a lot of people, right? That's a, a, a lot. If you just did the math where in your living room, if you're watching online, or if you are at our church gathering, if you just look around and you begin to count every third person, that is a person who might be dealing with some sort of depression, right? It's, it's drastic. It's, it's serious. There, there are all kinds of challenges that people face right now. Now, incidentally, along with that, what we have seen is an increase in violent crime. Now, violent crime is a little different than property crime. Violent crime is person to person. It's people attacking one another, people harming one another. And so what we're seeing is that Violent crime, person-to-person crime, is on the rise, while even though we might see property crime on the decrease. And so what we're seeing is that in a culture that is filled with chaos and a lot of transitions and a lot of frustrations of all different kinds, we're seeing people discouraged and we're also seeing people hurting one another. Because people are hurting, what we're seeing is that it's spilling out into culture and hurting people, we've, you might have heard this phrase before, hurt people, hurt people, right? And we're seeing that happen in our culture and in our society, in our cities, in the rural areas, maybe even in your family, in your schools, in your workplace. HR managers have said they've never seen, they've never seen a, a time like this in the life that they've been serving in their particular role. So everybody's tense and everybody's stressed and everybody is finding it difficult. So here we go back into 1 Peter. And remember, Peter's writing into a chaotic culture where Christians are trying to live for Jesus and glorify him and proclaim the gospel both through their words and through their lives. They're trying to declare and demonstrate the gospel. And so Peter's writing to them, encouraging them on how to do that. And so far, what we've seen is that Peter encourages us to have the right perspective about the world that we live in. First, he says, this is not your home. You're just passing through. He calls us aliens and strangers. So remember, we're, we're not trying to make a, a, a utopia and an ideal situation out of a broken and sinful world because it can't be done. He also stresses to us that we're supposed to live in the right relationship with others, with, with one another and with authorities, with our, our bosses, with, with our spouses and with one another. And so it's important to live in right relationship with one another. And part of that involves living in submission. And submission is not this weak word, but it's living according to the place that God has assigned you. And we've been talking about the past several weeks that God assigns us particular places so for us to learn particular lessons or for us to do something specific for him in the situation that he gives us. And so that involves us living in submission to where God has placed us and to the circumstances that he's placed us in. We also know that if there's a line that is is put before us that we have to cross that causes us to deny our faith or deny God or disobey him, we know that that's not a, a, a guideline or a, a command that we're to follow, right? Because we're supposed to be faithful to Jesus. And Peter's wrapping up all of these thoughts in this section right here, and here's what he wants us to know. He wants us to know that we've got to live with the right attitude, And that we've got to have the right actions that come from that right attitude. And that we're not to do evil, but we're to be a blessing to others. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. How do we... How do we be a blessing, right? You, you want to be blessed. I want to be blessed, right? We, we want good things to happen to us. We want to do good things in our community. We would love people to say of us, you know what? That person just is a blessing. Like, I'm so thankful for them. They're encouraging. They're, they're helpful. They're kind. They're good. God calls us to be a blessing. And so Peter's writing and wrapping up this section to these Christians who are trying to figure out how to live in a crazy and chaotic world, to live steadfast in the truth of God's word. How do we do that? Peter's writing to them and he wants them to understand how to do that. And it involves the right attitudes and the right actions. Look at what he says in verses eight and nine of first Peter of chapter three. Here's what it says. Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic, 
love one another and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called to this so that you may inherit a blessing. So right up front, here's what Peter shows us, that if we're going to live in a chaotic world that's filled with crisis and calamity, we have to have the right attitudes. What he says in verse 8, finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Now, we have to be honest about the condition of things right now. People are extremely divided. Things are very tense and people are very tense. Many people are just, their fuse is lit and they're right on the edge, right? People are, are just frustrated. They're frustrated. And so Peter is suggesting that we live in a particular way here that begins to diffuse all of that. Well, what are those suggestions or what are those recommendations that he makes to us? The first one is that we be like-minded. Now, like-mindedness is about unity, not uniformity. So he's not asking us all to think the same things and do the same things and all of that. What he's saying is he's saying there needs to be a sense of unity among you. Like you have the same mindset, you have the same goals. We're going to get to a verse here in just a minute that really unpacks that for us. But Peter says, in order to live in a chaotic world with the people that you're doing life with and the people that you share a common faith with, you've got to be like-minded. He says this, you, you also need to be sympathetic. Well, sympathy is, is caring deeply about the needs, joys, concerns, and desires of people around you. Being sympathetic. Right? It's not weak, it's, it's being sensitive to what they want. He, he says that we're to love one another. The word love that he uses there is the, the word that describes brotherly and sisterly love. The word phileo, that's where we get the word Philadelphia from. And if you ever talk to somebody, you know, Philadelphia is really supposed to be the city of brotherly love. But if you talk to somebody who lives in Philadelphia, they'll say this about Philadelphia. It's not the city of brotherly love, it's the city of brotherly shove right? We live in a culture like that, right? Where it's hard to love other people. And Peter says to us, you got to love other people. You have to have compassion. Compassion for everybody who's experiencing some kind of challenge or pain or struggle. Maybe they're dealing with a sin that, that just keeps dominating their life. They're just really, really hurting. And Peter says, you have to have compassion. And then lastly, Peter says, you have to do all this with a sense of humility. Well, humility is, is really viewing yourself and others in an appropriate light as God views you, right? So all of these things are absolutely important if we're going to live in the right kind of relationship. And look at all of those things. They're all attitudes. And so what we have to understand is, is the right attitude often has to occur and be resident in us before it produces the right actions, now, one of the passages that really begins to put all of this together in a, in a specific way is a, a passage that comes from the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. In verses 1 through 4, what Paul Paul's writing to the church and he's asking them to be like Christ. And, and so he begins this section in the book of Philippians this way, and I think it really applies to what we're dealing with here in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says this, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, and the natural answer is yes, there is, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship with the Spirit, if there's any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, and do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. And everyone should look not to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Right? So you see, there's this, there's this design that when we live in community with one another, there's so supposed to be this, this sense of unity, right? We're one in, in connection, one in purpose, one in love. And all of that centers in not on what we believe about the culture or politics or whatever, it all centers in and is built upon Christ. Like if there's any encouragement in Christ, there, and the natural answer is there is. And Paul says, you have to be united in Christ, one in purpose, one in heart, one in focus to help people understand who Jesus is. When you're like that and you have that sense of unity among yourselves, then there will be a special connection among you. And a community like that 
living like that is an example to the wider culture. It's unfortunate, but oftentimes in the community of faith and in, in churches, there's a sense of division and a sense of, of dividedness that just crops up and people believe a, a, that, that they can't have that unity. And so Paul raises the level uh, of unity, not to the things that we believe about our everyday worldly existence. And this is what Peter's writing about too, is not being concerned about the things of this world, but he's saying we must be united in Christ. One in heart, one in purpose, focusing on how do we demonstrate and declare the gospel where God has called us to be. The right attitudes will lead to the right actions. This is what Peter is telling us. Now, if we have the right attitude, then it leads to the right actions. What is he saying are the right actions? Well, he he gives us a a glimpse of that in verse 9. We're called to be a blessing. Here's what it says. We're not to pay back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called to this so that you may inherit a blessing. Now, there's a definite response that happens in us when somebody does something against us. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. What do you think about doing? Well, you think about whatever you think about, right? Somebody says something on your social media and they comment in a particular direction. Maybe it's a little snarky or it's a little little jaded or it's a little sarcastic. What do you think? What's your first response? Well, first response is, I'm going to get them back. If you have children or if you remember when you were a sibling in a family and if someone did something to you, what is your first default response? Well, I've got to do the same thing back to them, right? In middle school, if somebody said something negative about you, gave you a burn, a verbal burn, what did you want to do? Well, you wanted to figure out how do I get them about the Get them back. The the response that we have towards others who wrong us or or who we perceive wrong us, we we want to get them back in some way. Peter's saying, let's not do that inside the family of God, inside the church. Let's not do that in the culture, he's saying. When somebody wrongs us, what do we want? We want accountability and we want justice. Somebody does something wrong, we we want to make sure that, that... They get what's coming to them. And if they don't get what's coming to them according to what we feel, we might want to get revenge in some way. We want to give back to them what they gave to us and maybe give even a little bit more. Maybe we want them to experience some sort of punishment and and have some sort of costly penalty that would occur to them. But what if, what if none of these things are realized, right? And often they're not. What if all the things that we want to happen as part of our default response? What if none of those things happen? What do we do? What do we do when we're wronged and when evil is committed against us and it goes unaddressed? Well, again, we, we recycle some of those desires that I mentioned earlier. We, we might look for a way to pay that person back who wronged us or to get back at a group or, or an organization. We, we might create, and this is sort of a, a less active one. This is a passive one. We might create in our minds a debt that they owe us and we assign it to them or we assign it to a group of people or an organization that wronged us. And, and the problem with that is, is, is nobody else knows about that debt except for us, right? And so we, we carry this heavy debt that somebody owes us something and sometimes the person who incurred the debt doesn't even know that they have a debt. We have a debt against them. Now that doesn't work very well, does it? Some, when those two previous things don't work, what we end up doing is we retreat from, from life and all future situations and relationships and experiences where we might be wronged again. And so we just, we close off and we pull back and we isolate. And some people retreat into victimhood. And every subsequent relationship that they have is always viewed through that lens. Is that person going to hurt me? Or that person slighted me? Well, that interaction didn't go as I thought it would go. And maybe they have something against me, so I'm going to disconnect from them. Now, Peter gives us a better way to relate in a world where hurt is certain. Look at what he says. Don't pay back evil for evil or insult for insult. But on the contrary, give a blessing since you were called to this so that you may inherit a blessing. So he says, instead of retaliating... Instead of living in a conflict, perpetuating kind of way among others, 
Why don't you find a way to not pay back evil for evil, insult for insult, instead do something that is the entire opposite of those two things. Give a blessing. Bless them. Now, some of us grew up in the South, and maybe some of us who grew up in the Midwest, we might have heard this phrase, well, bless your heart, <laughs> right? You might have seen so, some things that, that portray that in such a way where somebody actually says that, or maybe it's painted on a wall, well, bless your heart. So we wanted to do a little kind of intro to what bless your heart sometimes means in the mind of others. So watch this short clip. Bless his heart. Once we get married, he won't be watching as much football. Bless her heart. Oh, oh, hey, hey, guys. Here you go. Next one. Next time. Next time. Bless his heart. Bless her heart. Well, hopefully. Uh, as you watch that, you realize that some people, when they say bless your heart, they really don't mean bless your heart, right? It's kind of this, this phrase that, that's this negative phrase that's almost passive aggressive. Is that what Peter's saying? He's not saying that at all. Remember, he's saying don't pay back evil for evil, insult for insult. And in fact, I think Peter would, would even say if you have an attitude that you, that you put on somebody for something that they have done that, that is not biblical is not honoring is not blessing in a true sense that that he would call that out in you and call that out in us and he's saying that we shouldn't live that way with one another what he's saying is we've got to break the cycle that exists in culture the cycle that exists that just passes the hurt along from person to person to person a friend of mine who's a pastor in Colorado posted something on his social media. Look at this picture. I want to show you this picture. It talks about and shows and illustrates the generational hurt that's passed on to us from previous generations. And so you have a negative word that comes from somebody who's removed from you a couple of generations and then another negative word. And then somebody has to decide in that generational succession to live in a different way and not pass along the hurt. This is what Peter's writing about. He's saying instead of cursing someone and paying an insult forward, it must be broken. You got to break that cycle. And the only way you can break that cycle is to bless. Now, it's likely true that many of you who are either here today for worship or you're listening online, you may have had some sort of generational harm that's been done to you, some sort of generational curse or some sort of generational thing that's been passed along to you, a, a harmful thing that was said to you that you remember immediately. And even though it occurred decades ago, you can bring it right back up. Let me say this. You don't have to repeat the cycle. The cycle can be broken. You don't have to pass along the hurt. But the only way that that can be done is when you choose to do something different. And that something different, according to Peter, is rather than keeping the cycle of insult and hurt going, you must choose to bless. One commentator says this, this sounds impossible on its face. It just sounds so difficult that you can't even imagine yourself blessing someone who hurts you. And so he then writes and says, the blessing for insult response is the one in which we kindly react when we suffer ill treatment. It springs from an attitude of forgiveness. It has its focus on God and its promises on his word. And so instead of reacting in anger, we respond with forgiveness. And those who inflict evil or hurl insults at believers what he says is should not be repaid in kind as tempting as it might be to strike back. Now, how do you do that, right? How do, how do you come to the place where when someone speaks a, a harsh word towards you or an insult or an unkind word, somebody gives you a curse in the modern day terms, how do you, how do you respond in a different way? Well, one is we have to think about Jesus' example and then we have to be willing to let the Jesus in us influence our response. 
Now, we could remind ourselves in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, that when Jesus was insulted, he did not insult back. Look what it says in verse 23. It says this, when he, Jesus, was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Right? So Jesus didn't, didn't give back an insult, give back a harsh word. He didn't curse. Jesus kept silent. And that's an awesome example for us. For sometimes when we are cursed, when somebody says something harsh against us, one of the best things for us to do is to really not respond in any form or fashion with any words or any response. Now, Jesus consistently instructed his disciples to do this. This was not just a one-time thing that he did. It says this in Luke chapter 6. Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he says this, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. So Jesus is, is saying, don't engage a person who is cursing you and attacking you. Just be, be, be done with that and don't perpetuate the cycle of of this retribution. Jesus says, break that cycle. It says this in Matthew chapter 5, if someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. And so what Jesus is saying here is someone's going to take advantage of you, like, just let it go. Right? Let it go. And don't perpetuate the cycle of retaliation. Now, what does it mean to bless? What does it mean to, because this is something that's hard for us, right? Well, you might be saying practically, well, how do I bless somebody who is harsh with me? What, how do I live in a way that, that perpetuates this blessing and, and helps transition culture? Well, Peter does something here. He reaches back to the book of Psalms, and in Psalm 34, he pulls out some truths for us to understand because the question we have is, like, man, how do, we, how do we bless? Look at what he shows us here in Psalm 34, he unpacks it a little bit on how we can be a blessing. So the first thing that we can do to be a blessing is we can refuse to speak evil. In verse 10, it says this, For the one who wants to love life and see good days, here it is, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And how do you do that? Like, how do you keep your tongue from speaking evil? Because here's what we need to know, right? Your speech is connected to your heart. What you say comes from a place inside of you, from your heart. And we understand the heart is not just the, it's not the physical heart. It's the mind. It's the emotions. It's that, that seat of who we are. And so one of the things that we must understand is we can get a pretty good picture of our heart by the things we say, especially when we're under attack, when we're stressed, when somebody's come against us. One of my friends uh, from a while back, one of the things that she used to do is when she was tempted to say something bad, she would just physically grab her mouth. It was like the most hilarious thing, right? When we were talking and we were talking about a difficult situation or she was talking about a, a, a frustration or a struggle and if she was tempted to say something bad, she would just grab her mouth as like a signal to stop talk. Stop talking right now. Don't go any further. And have you ever been having a conversation with somebody and you're, you're listening to the words, you're forming the words and listening to the words as they come out of your mouth and the thought occurs to you, it's probably a, a God-given Holy Spirit influence thought, hey, time out, you just need to stop talking. Right? Stop it. <laughs> like, don't say another word. Right? That's God influencing you. One of the best ways to watch what you say is to bring God's word into your life. And one of my favorite verses is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Look at what it says. It says this, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is good for building others up, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Right. So if you memorize this verse, one of the things you're going to notice is that, that it tells you, don't let any unwholesome or corrupting talk come out of your mouth. The only thing that should be coming out of your mouth is whatever would build up someone and encourage them. So the filter, right? the filter that you should put in front of your speech is, is it helpful? Is it building people up or does it corrupt? Does it, does it break down? Does it hurt this person? Does it make this situation a bad situation? If it does, don't talk like that is what the scripture says. We've got to watch what we say. And one of the best ways to watch what we say is understanding 
that what we say comes from our hearts and having the right attitude leads to having the right actions and in this case leads to having the right speech. Another thing that Peter says is if we're going to bless others, we need to reject revenge and do good and seek peace. Verse 11 says this, let him turn away from evil and do good and let him seek peace and pursue it, right? So he says, if you want to see good days, if you want to have a blessed life, turn away from evil, do good, seek peace and pursue it. So literally what he's saying is do a 180, right? If if you're in a situation where you are tempted to, to really move forward and, and hurt someone or respond in kind in that sort of way, he says, do a 180 and it's best to walk away. Walk away and then seek peace. Maybe, maybe there's some relationship or some situation, some group of people, some setting where you are at odds. And what Peter would say is rather than just walking away and staying away, it might keep you from inflaming the situation, but you should seek peace. You should do good. You should try to, to see if that can be redeemed and restored in some sort of way. So seek peace and pursue it. He says this then, live with a growing awareness of God. Verse 12 says this, do all these things because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Now the psalmist is describing the reality here that you and I often forget. Here's the reality. God sees how we live. Like he sees how we live. Like we don't hide anything in our lives from God. Like he's aware of it all, right? He can see the attitudes of our heart even, like not just our actions and what we say and encounters that we have, but God sees the attitudes of our heart. He sees the emotions as they form in our minds and in our bodies and and in our lives. God hears us. He hears everything we say. He hears everything we think. And God, we know this, scripture is abundantly clear. God judges those who do evil. Right? So, so God will judge evil. And if he doesn't judge it right in the here and now, we know that ultimately at the end of all time, all evil will be judged. And so in this context, what Peter is saying is he's saying, live with an awareness that God sees every response, every attitude, every action, every word, every thought, every intent of your heart. God sees all of those things and be aware that he sees those things. And then know this. God will judge the unrighteous and the evil. God has you. God will protect you. God will deliver you. Trust that. And when we live with an awareness that God knows everything about us and sees everything about us and that God will judge those who are unjust and those who sin and those who do evil and those who harm, what can we do? And we can release this desire in our life to pay back evil for evil and insult for insult. When we live like that, what what does it do? Man, it makes life absolutely freeing. It frees us up, right? So somebody says something that's, that's out of line or that's harsh or that's mean or that's evil, we can just let it go in the sense that we know that God will, God will judge that, right? And that God has that, and we don't have to worry about that. And if if it does impact us, what can we do? We can take our hurt to God, and we can leave it with Him. So here's some things that I want to share with you as we close. First is this. If you're somebody who's troubled and hurting because of some interaction, some relationship, some words from the present or from the past, bring all of that to God today. Bring all of it to God today and tell Him about it. He already knows about it, but bring it to him and tell him about it and and let him him help you understand that you are listened to and you are loved. For the one who's struggling with a desire to, to enact or seek some sort of revenge, to get some sort of justice and payment, hey, friend, give that over to God because there's nothing you could do that would exact everything you want. It's impossible. Only God can do that. To the one who may be struggling with the desire to deliver the blistering speech that you've been writing in your mind for years, 
ask God to give you new words and ask him to give you a new heart and ask him to guard your tongue. These are some great things that can help us be a blessing in the world. Here's the reality as Christ followers, we have the opportunity to disrupt the pattern of conflict and chaos in the world. And we can do that because God has disrupted the pattern of sin in our lives. One of my favorite verses comes from Romans and it says this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So here's the deal. You and I, we're sinners. The people who do all those things that have harmed us and hurt us and made us frustrated, they're sinners. We stand on the same common ground, each of us in need of deliverance by the power of God displayed in the person of Christ. And so we might be here today at this place and you might be here at this place today, never having trusted Jesus as your savior. Can I just ask you to do that, right? The person that you are so angry at, the person that you are so frustrated by, the person who has hurt you in so many ways, can I, I just want to, this is going to be hard, but can I just tell you that you and I as sinners have offended God even more than that. And yet what God did is he sent Jesus to die for our sins, to redeem us and restore us because he loves us that much. And if God loves us that much and can deliver us from that grave of sin, then God can deliver you from the hurt that a person has created in your life. But you're going to have to trust him and you're going to have to rely on him. And we're all going to have to rely on God to help us get over the hurt that we've experienced in life. We're called to bless and not to curse. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your goodness. And so I pray for my friends who are struggling and hurting with all kinds of things that that have been done to them or said to them or things that have happened to them. And, And their only thought is anger and revenge and justice. And they can never get that. Would you help them see that they can bring all of those things to you? And because you made us right with you, you redeemed us from our sin, that you can set things right for them. And it may not be here on earth, but it may be in eternity. Would you help them understand that and see that? And Father, would you draw people into a saving relationship with you? Those who are so burdened and eaten up with bitterness and anger and frustration and hurt and wanting to lash out and harm those who have harmed them, would you deliver them from all of that by bringing them to the point of salvation where you reach into their lives and they say yes to you and you make them brand new inside, delivering them from all of those things that would keep them from enjoying the life that you've called us to live here. Father, would you bring them to salvation today? That's what I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of life who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. Who hath borne all our sins and hath cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. 
Billy child with thy love May each soul be rekindled With fire from above Hallelujah, thine the glory Hallelujah, amen Hallelujah, thine the glory Revive us again